on my first trip abroad and uh, as a good American girl from New York where I went first was to Paris. Somebody drove me to Florence and introduced me to some of the young people there. And among them was uh, this um, uh, blonde, blue-eyed count who was extremely arrogant. He was, very, he was very popular with women, so he was very arrogant, so I didn't really like him very much. But um, <clears throat> he was about to leave for <clears throat> me, a diamond hunting expedition in the South American jungle. The thing that attracted me was certainly not diamonds. <clears throat> it was jungle. And in fact, as a child, I was always attracted to Tarzan and everything that had to do with jungles. Because it seemed to me, and, and this is in retrospect, because I didn't have the words then, but I'm sure this was it because it just, it just feels right, that there was something original about it. There was something right about it. If you're in a jungle and you're a person, person animal, then you've got to be in the right place. It felt as though whatever went wrong, it hadn't gone wrong yet while you were still in the jungle, something like that. And Tarzan even was represented as pure. So that view of man in the jungle was that he's pure when he's in the jungle. I think that was the whole idea, that it was somehow before the fall. So that was a, a very exciting. I mean, to go in, and live in the Stone Age, you know, it's like going to the moon or something, you know, just go and live in the Stone Age from Manhattan. It's, it's pretty, pretty amazing and, and um, rich experience for, for a person. And um, I mean, bit by bit, if I, if I looked at my notes, because I always kept journals, which are lost now, unfortunately. But um, the journals that I kept, it looked as though I were making notes for the continuum concept. But in fact, what I was doing was questioning things all the time. And um, so I suppose I was looking for what I found. I then realized that, that I had not just unlearned, as I, as I thought of it, um, a lot of presumptions that we have about human nature. Our civilization has about human nature, such as, for example, boys will be boys, bad, you know. Um, oh, well, it's only human nature, bad. Um, well, you have to socialize children because otherwise they will be antisocial or at least asocial or something. Um, and when you say children, you're talking about human nature. You're talking about the, the material of human nature, which we then uh, live with and, you know, we become, we, we mold it into what becomes adults. And in fact, I mean, just to jump ahead a bit, it, it, it gradually dawned on me during, the, this was a particular year after the fourth expedition when I began to see, because once I, I realized something, I had one or two insights and then other insights began to go off like popcorn from there. You know, well, if this is true, well, then this must be true. Gosh, wow, you know, and I was quite excited about it. And then um, I began to realize that we made a terrible mistake about what human nature is. We just got it wrong. And, you know, amazingly enough, the blindness that I had, I mean, despite the fact that I hadn't finished college and I never read a book, so I was, you know, reasonably illiterate, reason, reasonably unschooled in the culture, at least not academically. So I had, I mean, from my point of view, an advantage in not having rigidified my, my intellectual or my views, let's say. Um, but even so, I was living for literally years. It was over, uh, it was about three years or thereabouts that I was living looking straight at these Indians, living with them, and not seeing what I was looking at because I just was so blinded by our view that I didn't even notice, amazingly enough, that the children never argued, unsupervised. They'd play together all day, unsupervised, tiny children from, you know, whatever, crawling, walking age, one year, whatever, up until, you know, the age they could still be called children, 10, 12, and... 14 or whatever, they never, not, not only didn't fight, but they never even argued. And I mean, this is not what we have been taught is human nature or boys will be boysing, you know, at all. Um, so I thought, well, boys won't be boys. There's something, something wrong here. Somebody's got something wrong here. But it, it was such a long time before I noticed. One just thinks, oh, well, these are little savages. They're, you know, they're 
got red paint on and they have little loincloths and feathers in their ears, so they're not people. Well, of course, they are people. They're exactly the same species as we, except that they are behaving the way we have all evolved to behave. And we are completely crazed with, with being mistreated as infants and children, treated inappropriately for our species. And as a result, what we have done, and, and I'm putting it strongly on purpose because it is this bad, we have actually, we have actually created an antisocial population by this very means. It's not an accident. Nobody's born rotten. You don't have just bad kids. It's not true. There is no such thing, but you can make them. And ironically, the reason that you make children be bad or antisocial is the way, the way it's possible to do this with, with this profoundly social animal that we in fact are is by um, the fact that, that, they, that, they are, that we are so social. The fact that our, our parents, our tribesmen, our authority figures, whatever you want to call them, are so clearly expect us to be bad or antisocial or, or um, greedy or selfish or dirty or destructive or self-destructive or whatever. We so clearly are expected to do this that because we are so social, ironically, we meet those expectations because our sociality actually develops in human beings that way. The way it is meant to develop that we meet the expectations of our elders. And now this is whenever historically this reversal took place when our elders stopped expecting us to be social and expected us to be antisocial, just to put it in gross terms, that's when the real fall took place. And we are paying for it so dearly. I mean, just imagine the alienated um, people that we have around us. Why do we have to lock our doors? Why do we have all these police forces? Why do we have armies against each other? I mean, it's not just Americans. It's the whole of Western civilization, so-called, whatever, you know, I mean, loosely called Western civilization. Um, laboring under a misapprehension about what human nature in fact is. As I say, I, would, I was looking at these children behaving. My, my, one, of my, one of my later partners, a, a Belgian, used to, uh, when he saw the, the little boys running around with their bows and arrows and whooping and, and uh, running and jumping and so forth, he used to say they were playing Indians, but, which is kind of funny because they were Indians. But um, the fact is that w no matter how roughly and wildly they played, it was never antagonistic to anybody. And very rarely did they have any accidents. There were no supervision by adults. Um, children, for example, and quite small ones, like three, four, and five-year-olds, would be carrying babies around all day. Not, you know, no one saying, you know, sit here and you can hold the baby while you're sitting down and watch out. So trusting, tr trusting very small children to take care of infants because, in fact, their instincts are just out there and there's no way that they're going to do anything wrong because five minutes ago they were babies themselves. They, they just know how to take care of babies. And here we are, great big grown-up louts that we are, you know, in, in our 20s or 30s or whatever, reading books about how to take care of babies. When, I mean, in fact, I, was, I mentioned to someone who was interviewing me after the first expedition, someone uh, for the New York Times, that I'd be embarrassed to admit to the Indians that where I come from, um, the women um, don't know how to take care of their children until they read the instructions written in a book by a man, a man that they've never even met. I mean, I wouldn't tell them that because they wouldn't have any respect for me ever again. I mean, if you, if you were there, you wouldn't, you wouldn't either. You'd see how inappropriate it would be to admit that we were that far off. What, what I think I can contribute is, is to say and to draw attention to what is in fact our evolved nature, what is our innate, um, uh, what are our innate tendencies and expectations. Now, when I spoke to the people, some of the people at, at the Center for Cognitive Studies when, when I was up there some years ago, they said that they didn't, they didn't accept that there were such a thing such things as expectations, innate expectations, as I was postulating. And they did say, well, if you say so, then it's up to you to prove it, to demonstrate it, which I think I've, I've done quite clearly and not just attempted. But I think, you know, the, these are, these are um, 
things that have have stood up now over the passage of time because my book when I finally did write it, the continuum concept came out first in England in 1975 and then in, in America in 77 and other countries um, later. What we think of as the way children are, normal, whatever it is, is it includes something like, well, for example, there's, there's uh, I forgot whether it's called three-month colic or whatever it's called, something like that, where babies are constantly throwing up. I mean, what they're doing is vomiting, which they say, they say, what do they call it, spitting up so it doesn't sound so much like a desperate illness, but it is a desperate illness. It's painful, and I mean, it's obviously, it's, well, it's, it's an illness. It's not okay. Um, this happens even when babies are drinking their mother's milk. They're still throwing up. They're still, they're still violently ill. There's a, a lot of, you know, contractions and pain and so forth. Now, why is this? Why on earth, how on earth could we conceivably believe that we are evolved after hundreds of thousands, nay, millions of years into what we've now become, which is Homo sapiens, without, without somehow solving the, the, uh, the problem of digesting our own mother's milk? I mean, no other animal has this. And it stands to reason that our mother's milk is digestible to us just as it is to every other animal. So why, why do we have indigestion? Well, I think it's quite clear that, that the reason that we have indigestion so uniformly, mind you, the people that I saw in the jungle never had indigestion unless they were violently ill with some fever or something, the babies, they never threw up. They didn't certainly routine, routinely throw up. And they were also not wriggling and struggling and arching and flexing and squeaking and so forth like ours do normally. We keep saying normal because we've never seen any, we've never seen a comfortable baby is, is the truth of it. Well, what it is is stress. I mean, the babies are so stressed that they can't keep, keep their food down. That from the minute a baby is born, we, we declare war upon it. And we immediately, coached by these experts and by our mothers and by the society around us, not by our own feelings, um, oppose the baby. We, we take on a sort of war of wills and uh, the baby is hungry and cries and we say no, got to be four hours between feeds. One of the great things is that the first minute that a baby is born it's opposed by being taken out of the womb and immediately, well, first things are stuck up its nose and things are stuck down its throat for reasons. They're always technical reasons. I mean, to take out mucus or to do this or to that, whatever it is. Okay. And then weigh it and measure it, which isn't doing anybody any good to weigh and measure a baby at that incredibly sensitive time in its, in its life. I mean, that's, it's, you know, for what? The Bureau of Statistics or something, no one ever sees it again. Or maybe because the, uh, they want to know what its astrological sign is or something, but it's not going to do the baby any good to be weighed and measured whatsoever. What it needs is to be in its mother's arms, and the mother even more so needs to have the baby in her arms so as to have this, this beautiful moment of falling in love, which is all choreographed by these exquisitely evolved hormones which make it happen right away because if you weren't interested in this total stranger who isn't too cute at that stage anyways probably all bright red and gooey and everything else but you you're all programmed to fall madly in love with it and to put its life even you know above your own in your caring for it because if you didn't I mean we wouldn't survive I mean if you were exhausted after giving birth you'd say oh well forget it you know just drop that little thing in the river and don't worry about it, or just you leave it there for a minute, leave it, you know, I'll, I'll be back later. Well, you know, the wolves would have gobbled them up by that time. So obviously it's very important that we um, have this great falling in love, otherwise known as bonding, otherwise known as imprinting um, kind of ceremony, which is built into us. It's built in because it has to be. It has to be for our survival. It has to have been there for us to have been the successful species that we are. Successful meaning that we survived, right? Over hundreds of thousands. Without Dr. Spock, amazingly enough, we managed to survive um, without any experts at all. So, I mean, what I'm, I mean, what normal is, is adversarial. 
so that the baby arrives and I insist that it expects, it has an innate expectation that it will be among trustworthy allies and that whoever holds it and whoever is in charge of it is, is, uh, has it in, his, in, in her, her or his care will be someone who is friendly, if you like, who is on, if I'm the baby, is on my side. Well, that's not what happens. They're not on my side. Whatever I want, they say no. I want to be with my mummy. I want to sleep with her. I want to be close. I want to be safe. I want to be with someone alive who's breathing and who's warm and who smells right and who feels right and who touches me and makes me feel my, my own flesh appropriately. Not a, a lifeless box, a lifeless cloth and hear myself screaming in my own ears and hear other people screaming around me and, and, and get no response because I feel, I feel when I scream when I'm a newborn baby, I feel when I scream that something's supposed to happen because I scream. That's why I'm screaming, not just to scream but because I'm waiting, I'm expecting something. And it doesn't come and I just scream more until I'm exhausted. So what normal is, is adversarial. So that's why I'm now lately emphasizing the word, the words non-adversarial child rearing or child care because I want to point up the fact that what we're doing now is adversarial people. I hope it shocks people a little bit when they realize that what they're doing with all the love that they have in their hearts, and I have no doubt of that, is adversarial. When you're following the doctors or the experts or, or your mother-in-law or your mother or your sister or whatever it is, um, and, and you are feeding the baby on a schedule or you are denying it sleeping with you and being with you 24 hours a day, not less, um, you're being adversarial because it's perfectly clear that unanimously all the millions, billions of babies who are crying at this very moment because they want to be next to a live body, can they really, you really think they're all wrong? couldn't possibly all be wrong. This is the voice of nature. This is the voice of not intellectually interfered with or um, uh, interfered with in any way. This is the straight, clear, pure voice of nature. The baby knows what it's supposed to have. And the minute you put it down, it cries because it knows. And it's letting you know. It's signaling you perfectly clearly, don't put me down. Don't put me down. And we have built into us equally, without a dictionary, the knowledge of what that means when the baby goes wah, wah, wah. we know it means pick me up don't put me down don't leave me don't leave me my mother doesn't answer me when I cry so I feel that the power that I have to signal and to to summon and to get actually help to get a response there's some and unfortunately human nature is such that I cannot blame the non-respondent I, because of my nature, because of human nature, unfortunately it's like this, it turned out to be a great misfortune. I feel I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable enough. I haven't done the right thing. I'm not worth responding to. And this is universally the reaction of babies. They feel that they, are, they haven't done it right or they're not good enough because they believe in the authority, because they're so social, ironically. They believe in the authority of these people, their tribes, people, their elders, whatever, their parents. So if the parents don't come, they feel that their instincts, their instinct was to cry. They didn't have anything else to do, but it doesn't work. Can't be right. And then on top of that, as soon as they emerge into anything resembling consciousness, they want to do this and they try to do this, or they're looking under the blades of grass to see what's going, or cutting up worms, or tasting things, or, and say, oh, don't do that, no, don't do that, bad, naughty, whatever it is and constantly undermining our faith in our own instincts. The first job you have on Earth, which is dictated innately, um, is as an explorer. You go around sniffing and tasting and touching and looking at everything. And if people say, don't touch that, it's dirty, don't touch that, it's not, be careful, you'll hurt yourself, don't do that, you'll break it. All this kind of, it constantly undermines your feeling of competence. Now this goes on when you get to school, people say, stop talking to your neighbor, sit still when you, don't want, you didn't want to sit still, it's difficult to sit, you're just going to sit still, fold your hands, don't talk to your neighbor. Well, 
you want to talk because you have something to say and you want to ask them. not supposed to okay and then they say okay whatever you're doing which is to, you know what they're doing they're learning that's all they do they're just learning like little sponges all the time say well whatever you're doing is more or less the message stop it because this is worthless what is important is this now pay attention a is for apple now everything else is is undermined and pronounced worthless, except A, is, A isn't even for Apple. I mean, A can be for aardvark, it can be for God knows what, you know, anything you like. But I mean, they arbitrarily tell you that A is for Apple, and that's it, and nothing else counts. And they persist in this. The, all your authority figures persist in telling you that what you do on your own initiative, which is exploring, otherwise known as learning, if it's not taught, it isn't learning. And in fact, I mean, I've recently come to the rather startling, at least to me, and I imagine it would be to anybody, conclusion that learning, which is so obviously natural, okay, is natural, but teaching isn't natural at all. And in fact, I mean, I began thinking about it, and I don't remember ever seeing any of these people I'm talking about who live so successfully. I never saw any of them teaching. Even the children who learn from each other so much don't teach the smaller children. The, the little ones are learning from the, from the older children and from the adults, but nobody's teaching. They're learning on their own initiative, which is so powerful. You don't have to augment it. In fact, you can't really augment it. There's no way you can make a ch child learn better than he would if you leave him alone. Uh, it's possible for us to not know what we know so incredibly badly. I mean, we're just it's so, so far off because we have had our faith in our own competence undermined since infancy. So that by the time we're 18 or 25 or whatever, when we have our first children, we're so used to not believing our own instincts that, that we can have a total stranger in a hospital tell us something and, and we don't know any better. You know? We are the same hunter-gatherers that we were, and we have always been held by somebody we have not left anywhere, and if we had been, it would probably be gobbled up by crocodiles or bears or wolves or whatever came by and was hungry. So it's not possible that we could have been left alone. It stands to reason. And in fact, even if that weren't true, if there were safe places, if, if we were designed to be left alone, the babies wouldn't object. They wouldn't object uniformly the whole time. Um, they're either in the arms of their mothers, and certainly the first few days or week or so they are. Um, but not very long afterwards, they're handed around to anybody, and everybody loves to take care of babies. Children love to take care of babies. In fact, it seems to be a very powerful instinct in them, which we recognize by giving them dolls to play with. I mean, the fact that small children like to play with dolls we, we kind of recognize without actually recognizing it. They love to take care of babies. And in fact, they're extremely good at it. They haven't learned how to do it wrong the way we have. Babies, um, before they're mobile, before they're able to crawl, they just, you know, la, and you have to carry them around. And they, they're helpless, let's say. Um, they, they, they have, I mean, usually crawling starts around six to eight months, whatever it is. Before that, what I call the in-arms phase, or should be the in-arms phase. Um, a baby cannot discharge its own excess energy. And I'm not talking about any kind of new age, weird thing called energy. I'm talking about, you know, the physical energy that's the difference between being dead or alive. The, you know, energy, I'm talking about that kind of energy. When they're treated correctly, when their energy field is being discharged by um, an active and hopefully relaxed person, busy and so forth and so on, they, they remain comfortable and they're very easy. You put them from one hip to the other hip, put them on your lap. And believe it or not, and I can show you photographs of this um, because it is hard to believe, but a baby um, is very often held by a child by one hand like this, down the back, dangling like this. And they're not uncomfortable. So the idea that babies are fragile, and it's not true. I mean, they're incredibly unfragile. And, the, the, and the, more, the more action there is, the more jumping around and leaping about and seeing things, the better the baby likes it. But what I'm saying is that when a baby is relaxed 
and, and comfortable and is, not, and is having its energy discharged efficiently, you could take it to work with you, resolving this terrible dilemma of whether to work or to take care of the babies. But the way babies are now, they're obviously not welcome in workplaces because they're throwing up and they're squeaking and they're complaining and they're arching and flexing and they're difficult to hold. But if they are the way they are in these other places, um, it's no problem because they're soft, they're sitting on a hip, or they, and they're not resisting, and you don't even notice them. It's really trusting human nature, which is the big basic mistake that we make. We, we act as though human nature was something to be afraid of, to constantly be modifying or fighting against or uh, subduing or something, taming or, as they say, socializing. Um, and somehow, as I say, we have got away from um, believing that we are evolved in a way that works. We, we, we apparently believe that, that we are evolved in such a way that we have to be uh, seized upon and opposed from the very beginning in order to become viable, rather than that our nature, like every other animal, works fine the way it is. Now, how this got to be the way it is, is is a historical question. But I mean, let's face it, this is the way we are. We do not trust human nature. We distrust it in infants, in children, and in ourselves. It was, there was a beautiful example that happened, luckily, as I was watching um, in a Yaquana village one day, the village of Wananya. And um, what happened was that this fellow, Tududu, um, had in that day invented the playpen, if you like. I mean, here he was in the Stone Age, and like a good Flintstone, he invented the playpen that day. It just dawned on him, why don't we have a playpen? And he went out early and <clears throat> cut a lot of logs, lengths of, of uh, trees, and uh, brought them back and started to construct this thing. And he lashed two square frames uh, together over some uh, poles and made a Flintstones playpen. And then he took his son, who was just about one year old then, because he just started walking the week before, a little boy named Kanana Sinuana. And he took Kanana Sinuana, plonked him into the playpen, looking kind of proud of his handiwork. And Kanana Sinuana just looked around him and saw that he was trapped and let out one huge scream of displeasure, to put it mildly. I mean, he was horrified and just screamed, and his father didn't for one minute think, oh, he'll get used to it, which is what we would do. Well, he doesn't know, you know, what does he know? He's one year old, he'll get used to it, he'll be safer this way, and blah, 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 and so forth. His father, and this is what I'm talking about, trust, as, as just a way of being, a way of, of living with nature. He heard the screams of horror of the child and realized instantly, unqualifiedly, that he had made a mistake that it was not suitable for a child, he right then and there broke the thing up, threw it away. Unfortunately, it was green wood and he couldn't even use it for firewood. But there was no doubt from the sound of that child's voice that it was the wrong thing. Now, the difference between us and them, I think you can see so clearly there. I mean, we wouldn't in, in the world think that, that that meant anything that the child didn't like it. We say, well, good for him, he doesn't know it, but it's in his best interests and all this sort of thing. The one I was thinking of was pretty much Kanana Sinuana because that was the time when I was watching, and he was, as I say, about one year old at the time. And he was just running around like, like all the rest of the children, um, running around the compound. And uh, th they had dug a pit because they, they wanted the mud to make walls for, for one of the houses. and. Um, they just left the pit there. Not only that, but they'd thrown a lot of kind of branches with sharp sticks sticking up to make it worse. And it had rained, and <clears throat> it was partially filled with water. And um, some people had been relieving themselves into it. And you know, they threw a certain amount of debris into it. It was a pretty unpleasant pit. And um, Kanana Sinuana, who would just toddle, mind you, these were his first steps. He'd just begun to walk, so he was walking very you know, clumsily and so forth, um, learning to walk more gracefully. 
And he would sort of go up to the edge of the pit and he would sit down and then he'd stand up and somebody would fall down, boom, on his bottom and then he'd stand up and fall down and so forth. But he would never fall into the pit. Whenever he fell, it would be the other way. And he didn't appear to be doing it on purpose, but like any little animal, um, little puppy dogs and kittens don't appear to be uh, falling somewhere, you know, um, on purpose. It looks accidental, but they don't fall into the fire, do they? They don't fall into the pool, do they? Nature provides for them to preserve themselves. We trust, I mean, for example, with fires, we trust um, puppies and kittens not to go and burn themselves up in fires. We don't trust our own children. We who pride ourselves on being so wildly intelligent feel that we are the only ones who have children who are so stupid that they're going to go and throw themselves into fires and over the edges of, you know, out of windows and into swimming pools and all that. And that we, you know, the only animal that doesn't follow its mother. I mean, how can this be? Because we keep showing our children that we expect them to run away, and then we run after them and say, well, we can't take them anywhere. You have to put a harness on them or do something. Whereas all the people in the jungle and the people in Bali, the children follow them around. All kinds of other places where they haven't been taught not to. Of course they follow their parents around like, like other animals. So, I mean, the point is, again, as you say, trust. And these are examples of our paying a terrible price because of the fact that we do not trust our human nature, which works beautifully when we do trust it. And when we don't trust it, it's because our expectations are so visible and the child is so, <clears throat> excuse me, is so social that they are impelled to meet our expectations in order to make the sociality work. They work together with us by following our expectations. Unfortunately, our expectations are negative. And then we keep, we keep first of all, telling them how bad they are and then telling them to be good more or less. I mean, what we're saying when we say be good, the, the subtitle should be pretend to be good. Because if you really wanted someone to be good and you thought they were good, you wouldn't tell them that, would you? I mean, if so, the neighbors are coming to tea or something, you say to the child, now be good, or we're going to somebody's house, or we're going to kindergarten, now be good. It means pretend to be good because we know what you really are. You know? And the message is not lost on the child. The message goes in to the heart of the child, to his feeling where, well, the, the latest word is self-esteem, where his self-esteem is being formed. And what is formed is a feeling that I, I've got to learn to hide what I am. I'm really bad, I'm really antisocial, but I've got to try to look social to get away with things, to get by. And this is a very uncomfortable and extremely inefficient way to behave because you're constantly feeling one way and trying to pretend that you're not, and it's extremely inefficient. It cripples your behavior, it cripples your efficiency, your, co your competence, your agility. I mean, very often another, another example of trust is um, um, treating children as though they're terribly fragile, you know, taking a child and treating it like that from birth, when in fact they're not fragile. But if you keep treating them like that, so, oh, be careful, and, uh, they, they, you persuade them that they're fragile, and, and not, and that, which is a very uncomfortable way to feel through life, but it also prevents them from being very graceful, moving easily and with confidence, and in fact makes them more accident prone. This is, is an interesting example of one of our own tribe, an American baby, um, a little baby called Donovan, in fact, um, who was on a trip um, that um, I took to Bali recently, a couple of months ago. And um, this baby was, was just a year old, too, just a year old. And um, he was crawling along the edges of the swimming pool in the hotel where we were staying. And um, his mother, like a good American mother, loving American mother, was constantly right next to him, constantly, and putting a hand like this and so forth, as though he were going to fall into the pool. And at a certain point, we had a little meeting by the pool. We were going to discuss theory and so forth. And I said to Lisa, the mother, I said, now look, let's just do this if you can bear to do it. Just let Donovan manage with the pool himself and don't be near him and we will all watch him when he's not looking at us. We'll all watch him out of the corners of our eyes and he will get the impression that he's on his own. Let's just see what happens. So she bravely did it. She'd never done this before, obviously. I mean, no American mother, almost no American mother would. Anyway, so 
Donovan sort of backed toward the edge of the pool and put one chubby little leg in, and then it was he couldn't get the other one down because he could, felt he was overbalanced, he would fall in. So then he pulled that one up and they'd put the other one in. And bit by bit, he kind of wiggled around and he, he couldn't really, you know, get much of himself into the pool because, because, you know, the bound. But he was trying all these different things. This is exactly how children learn to be agile, competent, able, and so forth, left on their own. But he, he wasn't deaf, dumb, or blind, or stupid. He could see what was going on. He wasn't going to commit suicide. He was having too good a life. So he then went along the edges a bit and tried this and tried that. And then at a certain point, he saw that the edge of the pool was there. And then across the pool, there was a little wall that divided a shallower part from a deeper part. And it was submerged from the surface of the water about that deep. And it was maybe about that wide, or maybe like that, something like that. So Donovan saw that and then lowered himself over the edge of the pool onto that little wall. And he then crawled along, you know, onto the surface of the water. He crawled along this wall all by himself, something his mother would never have allowed. And he got to the middle where there was a fountain kind of arrangement. So he pulled himself up on the fountain and began playing with the water at the top. He had a great time and being extremely competent. And Lisa was out in the middle of the deep part, you know, nowhere to be seen as far as he was concerned, just not nobody, as far as he could see, was watching him. So he was doing all this on his own. Then at a certain point, while he was, um, he'd come down from playing with the water, he was back on the wall again. And suddenly Lisa appeared in the shallow part about three feet away from him. And he took one look at her and he went, Aah! put his arms up and regressed to the helpless infant that she'd always treated him as. I can't do anything, help me, mummy. Yeah. But you could see on his own what kind of a person he was, this one-year-old. And you could see him regress into the helplessness that his mother kept him in because of her lack of trust, if you like. It was so perfect. It was just you know, that last bit. I mean, we were, we were re I was really trying to get people to see how competent he was. But to see this regression the minute he saw his mother, because that's what he associated her with. I mean, the point is that what we have done is to, is to in, the, in the broadest terms, we have, we, we have lost trust in our own beings, our own essential nature. So that not only do we, I mean, obviously, we don't just mistrust children. We mistrust ourselves. We mistrust human nature itself. The reason I'm always talking about babies and children is because this is where it first manifests itself. And this is where it begins and is formed. But I'm talking about all human beings, and I'm talking about society. If you want to talk about how society got as, as uh, unpleasant as it has, to put it mildly, as dangerous, as unhappy, as alienated, as um, unstable, a anything that you want to say that makes us so unhappy, is, is because in childhood our penchant for being happy, joyous, and loving, and expecting to be loved is so totally undermined that we have to sort of live the way we expect to. What we believe is what we make our experience into. And what we believe is what we have been taught to believe by our experiences in infancy. And in fact, I mean, with my clients now that, that, that consult me about themselves and how to get a good feeling about themselves despite having been brought up in Western civilization. We talk about how, they, how their um, beliefs were, their unconscious beliefs become things like, well, you know, I never do anything right, or nobody could ever love me, or anyone who loved me must be a fool, or, or alternatively, I have to take care of everybody's emotional life. Sometimes people become the emotional support of their parents, or, or their mother, or their father, or both, or whatever. And of course, you never can completely emotionally support an adult if you're a child. So you're constantly failing, and you feel yourself to be a failure. So that one has these kind of core beliefs that undermine everything we do. And we keep marrying people and having affairs with people who give us the same bad feeling about ourselves that feels real to us, rather than people who love and adore us and who treat us with the kind of respect that we, we deserve. 
what I am advising you to do is something that in general I call non-adversarial child care, uh, which is to say, and it's so difficult for the most loving parents to stop being adversarial. And at first when you say you're adversarial, they say, oh no, I'm not, I adore my child, I do anything for him, spend all my time doing things for him, I'm cooking for him and washing for him and I spend all my time following him around. But what they're doing is following them around all day adversarially saying don't do this and don't do that. I mean, you look at someone like that, that's not, that's not an ally, that's an adversary. That's someone who's opposing. You say, well, you've got to teach them discipline. Well, no, you don't have to teach them discipline, it turns out. All you have to do, really, is genuinely to ex expect them to behave socially. And they do. They don't stop being social. And, and if, they have been, have the, if they have been treated with respect from birth, if they've been carried around and slept with every night and handed around to other people, and, but always been in contact and been in the middle of the action, in the middle of, the, of, of life, without being paid attention to. They don't need attention. In fact, they don't want attention. What they want to do is be able to pay attention to you. They want to be your satellite. They don't want the parents to be their satellite. And also, another thing that we've got reversed is that we think we're good parents if we wait on the children, you know, bring them their ice cream and uh, put on their clothes for them and carry things around and do things, pick them up and put them on chairs and t put them down and so forth. But, I mean, one rule that I've, I mean, I've got a couple of rules now that, um, that I, I pawn off on people. One of them is never to do anything for a child that it can possibly do for itself, even if it takes a while longer. Because every time you do something, not only do you give the child the message that it's, it's inefficient, incompetent, but you're actually preventing it from learning, from to having faith in its own ability to, to accomplish it, to figure things out. Let them figure it out. I mean, if it gets up onto a sofa or a chair and it can't figure out how to get down, leave it there until it figures it out. It'll try one leg and try another, but it'll figure it out. Or maybe you might eventually, if it's there long enough, you know, give it the next step, help it one step, but then don't do the whole thing for it. And give the child the, the message from the very beginning that, of course, you expect it to figure things out for itself. And, for example, if a, if a baby falls down when it's starting to walk or toddle or whatever and frightens itself and starts to cry, let it run to you, don't run to it. Because it can get, unless it's broken both legs, okay, then you can go to it. But, I mean, they haven't normally broken both legs. Let it run to you. Let it console itself on your body. Let it hold, you know, jump on your lap or let it hold on to your leg or something. But don't be all centered on the child because it gives the child the feeling, for one thing, that that, that you don't know what to do because you're constantly saying, would you like this or would you like mommy to do that or would you prefer daddy to do that? Would you like to go? Would you rather have this for breakfast or would you rather have that? It drives children mad because what they really want to feel calm inside is to have parents who know what they're doing without asking me because I'm just a baby. I don't want to be able to tell you. I don't want to direct your activities. I want you to know what to do. And then I want to watch what you do. And see you working and seeing you talking to other people and seeing you doing the different things that you're doing so that I can take it in. I'm, this is my way of learning is to follow you around. And then when I'm ready, I will imitate you because this is my natural impulse. You don't have to tell me, you know, now you do this and you do that. Just leave me alone and I will start helping you. You'll see. Yeah. Uh, having understood what I, what I observed in, in the jungle and then later beginning to see that I was learning some very important things about human nature in general. Um, it was a kind of obvious question. I mean, I could see a lot of things that I could tell people that we're doing wrong with babies and with children. Uh, but then there's this kind of obvious question, what about all the rest of us who already have been treated wrongly and inappropriately and we're all having a terrible time, we're all alienated, neurotic and so forth. How can we use those principles to do something maybe psychotherapeutic in some way for us. And that was a harder question that took a little longer, as they say, the impossible takes a little longer. The residue of those experiences and missed experiences have formed, the, the residue is in this form of beliefs. They are unconscious beliefs which make us feel such things as I can never can do anything right, I'm not lovable, and so forth. 
um, or I have to take care of everyone, or I could never take care of anyone because I'm useless, or whatever it is, or I'm just plain bad, or whatever I do is going to be done wrong, um, or I'm a goody-goody and I have to be good all the time, or a no, there's never an answer to that. I will be struck by lightning, I'll be annihilated, I'll be pushed off the edge of the earth, or mommy and daddy will leave me or something, but somehow I've got to be good all the time, whatever good is. You know, these beliefs that, that have been instilled in us uh, in infancy, before we're able to judge anything, we take these from our authority figures because it's our nature to do so. We cannot look in the mirror and say, well, I'm a nice little girl. I've got all my fingers and toes and I'm a sweet little thing and I'm intelligent and I'm charming and got a little pink party dress and I'm fine. I, you can't do that. You can only get your feeling about what's what, about yourself and about everything else from these authority figures. So if I'm looked at, as in fact I was, by my mother as though, well, why don't you just leave me alone, is what she used to say to me when I was about two years old. Um, I couldn't feel that she was wrong, although I now see that she was wrong. I just felt I must be wrong. I must be not the right thing, not what she wanted, not what she expected. And I didn't know how to be, to be right. Maybe that's why I became so idealistic, trying to be the right thing so I could be accepted. And this is what children do. They take the authority of these people and just believe it. And so the residue in the present, which is what we're interested in, the present and the future of your life, uh, what remains of this, it remains in the form of unconscious beliefs. In other words, I believe such things as, well, no one could ever love me, or I never do anything right, or I can begin things but I can't finish things, or I can finish things but I can't begin things, or whatever it is that I've got the message, or whatever I touch is going to be done wrong, or I've got to do everything right, or I've got to take care of my mother's emotional needs, or no matter what I do, I can't interest her. Whatever it is, this becomes the kind of basic feeling that I have about self and also about the relationship between self and other. We don't need to empower them to trust their nature. The tendency is to trust their nature. In order to allow them to do this, we have to show them that we trust their nature because we have this enormous power of authority and what we what we let them know and I'm not saying tell them because what we tell them is very often not what we show them that we expect like for example I say to you be good that doesn't tell you that I expect you to be good does it it ex tells you that I expect you to be bad whatever that is and that you should pretend to be good so that what, you ex what the child perceives that his authority figures expect of him is what he will believe, okay? So in order, so that, as I say, when I've got some rules for these parents that, that are, we're, together we're trying to get things right, rule one, I mean, rule two is don't do anything for a child that he can possibly do for himself, but rule one, above all rules, is never do anything to a child that will make him feel badly about himself. Because this is, we do this, it's just such a habit that we think it's instinctive and it's not. It's a habit. It's a cultural habit. What we do is to look at children like this, you know, which means even without saying anything, you turn the sound off right now and I'm doing like this, you know I'm against you, right? And that I say, you're not good. And on my authority, you can believe me, you are no good, you know? But if, if I, for example, now, okay, so what I say to parents um, is, um, th there are two ways which are generally looked upon to treat your children. One is the punishing, blaming thing. Very bad, you go stand in the corner or I'll spank you or whatever, you're bad, naughty man. Okay. The other one is permissive, which that's perfectly right, darling. If you want to walk on mother's face, she doesn't mind anything, it's fine, you know, it's everything. Anything you do is fine. Totally disorienting for a child who's looking at you and trying to find out what's going on and you're not telling them. You're waiting for them to direct you, and it drives them into fury and anger, and you can see it all over the place. The other way that, because people very often say, well, what other way is there? We don't know of any other way that isn't punishing or permissive. Well, the correct way, which no one realizes exists, is what I call information. If you understand, if you really thoroughly understand that a child is innately social, then you understand that what they want is the information. They want to know what's done. 
You don't have to be angry at them to tell them what's done. You just let them know. Do you know? You say, well, you know, put this over here and take this over there. And don't wait on the child, but let the child wait on you. Do you know the way I just said to John Michael, I said, would you, you know, pick those things up for me? But I wasn't saying, oh, how sweet of you, how wonderful, how Ma was praising him. Of course he's going to do it right. Do you know, I'm not going to insult him by saying, oh, you did that so well. You know, even though he's six years old, you know, he's confident. So the idea is not to blame, not to praise, because it's insulting, but to expect children to do the right thing. And then you're fitting in with their expectations, and they're calm, and they're happy, and there's no conflict. It all fits, and it's the way nature has designed us. Okay, now what the article was about is, is, uh, is how to change those beliefs which are engendered in us at this early age and remain in there. And then we try to cover, cover them up, try to, for example, look confident when we go to a party or, you know, try to look like a good girl or a good boy or to be a badder boy if possible, run around with a gang or something. But anyway, the point is that we're operating from a feeling about ourselves which is inaccurate, that we're bad, antisocial, whatever. And so what I, what I have understood is that what, what is harming us right now in the present is not our parents or anything else or the past. It's what in the present we believe. Now, of course, this is was formed, this habit of belief was formed in the past, but what is hurting us right now is the belief we have right now, at this moment, in us. So what we, what I, we direct all our work at, my client and me together, is finding out what the beliefs are and going back and remembering what childhood things formed the beliefs. And even though a lot of people can barely remember what was going on in their childhood, there are very few memories we can find out, and we do find out, and we can see how it was that they got the ideas, the beliefs that they have about themselves. And when we look at it together as two intelligent adults, we can see that they not only not true, they never were true. And we just keep making this case. It's like presenting a case in court. We make the case to that client's sort of inner belief system which is the kind of judge, and we, we go looking for evidence in the past and in, in, in their present behavior, uh, which is brought about by this belief. So they keep creating their experience out of these beliefs and expecting to be treated in a certain way, finding people who will treat them that way, suffering the consequences, saying they want something different, but in fact not expecting it. And, and unfortunately, you get what you expect, not what you want in life, because you know, your beliefs are operating so strongly. The beliefs and the expectations being the same thing. So that what we do is to just direct our attention, intellectually, just talking about um, how these beliefs were formed, what they are, and whether they make any sense. And somehow what happens is, and this is not intellectual, although our work is all intellectual, just talking to each other, we make the case, and we make the case, and we make the, At a certain point, something go, turns over in what I call the gizzard, you know, somewhere in the unconscious part where the beliefs, the unconscious beliefs are, which is to say the ones that, that motivate our spontaneous behavior, the ones that just make us act the way we do and feel the way we do. And at a certain point, we make the case and something turns over. We just said enough and a state of conviction comes over the person. And they say, gosh, you know, I keep meeting these people. I never met people like that before. They're all treating me so nicely and they never did before. Where were they? And they start very often wearing different clothes. They start looking different. They start talking differently because they're actually changing the beliefs and it's a, it's, it's a conditioning process. Sometimes I get them to just fake it, you know, pretend, you know, as though they were both the director and the actor in, in, in a play or a film, and, and just have them behave as though they believed. And that's one device. But what we're doing is one single thing, and that is changing the unconscious beliefs. And what I've discovered is that every single one of us, and I'm not talking about psychotics and people who are really, you know, disturbed in a chemical way or an organic way, but just, as I say, normal neurotics like us, which is most of the population, just about all of us, 
that we all have the same thing wrong with us. It's not as though we all have different problems. We all have the same thing wrong with us, and that is simply we feel badly about ourselves. And it's true, I keep, ex I, for, well, for a long time, not anymore, but for a long time I kept thinking, well, the next client I have is going to have something else wrong with them. But I've never had anyone else, had anyone have anything else wrong with them. We all have the same thing wrong. We feel badly about ourselves. Summing up is, is, as I say, you know, is, it's just broad sort of general thing is to, is to respect the child's name and to understand that the child is innately social. It doesn't have to learn to be social. This is hard for us to get. But once we've got it, it feels so right and so natural. And the child responds as though it had been waiting for it. And in fact, in some level, I think they have. They have little radars out all the time looking for the right experience. And they're always pushing us to get their experience right. So that when it comes out right, they respond. They're ready. You know, they they really want. But one of one of the techniques that that um, is very useful in in making the transition. You say, well, how? You know, if I've been adversarial and you know threatening and saying, now you do this or else or whatever. Um, how to get a child to do what you want them to do? I mean, you want the child to behave socially. Um, so instead of of punishing the child or scolding them for not doing, for example, um, say um, I want to say to say, say to a two-year or three-year-old, um, uh, take uh, take your toy in the other room. Okay, so I say, oh, take your toy in the other room. In a very matter-of-fact voice, not this way. Now, would you please take your toy into the other room? Which sounds as though I don't believe they're going to do it. It's built into the sound of my voice, isn't it? That I'm kind of pleading. And this makes the child feel insecure because he doesn't want his mother to be pleading. He wants his mother to be confident and know that he's going to take the toy into the other room. So I say, oh, take that into the other room, dear. And then I go and do that, knowing that he's going to. OK, now the first time that I do this, and he's never done anything the first time. He's used to having at least four or five times. Please, will you take it into? Now, will you do it now, please? And would you, you know? This constant kind, it's called nagging, and it's repetition and repetition until everybody's bored out of their skulls. The mother and anyone who's listening, the child, everything, because the child knows that he's not expected to do it right away. The mother has made the game, and everybody's patience is getting thinner and thinner. And eventually, the mother gets fed up or whatever happens. Okay, so the, the, the way to do this uh, so that the child will do and will cooperate and be social is you say, oh, you know, would you take your toy into the other room and then just go on talking. And if they don't do it, don't look at the child angrily or in any judging way, just very calmly and a little while, just go and take the thing and put it in the other room yourself. But don't talk to the child about it or mention it again. You've already made it perfectly clear that he was expected to do this. He didn't do it. So he missed the boat. There's no interaction. There's no scolding or begging or pleading or anything. There's no act. He's got left out. Now, when you think about it, a very social individual cannot bear to be left out. And what we usually do is have a big hassle over it, and they're all involved and engaged in this thing. Don't engage. Just go and do it yourself. And he sees life going past him. So the next time, usually it only takes once or maybe twice, but they don't want to be left out of the action.